saw your tweet about us having thin topics. I'm like, oh, there's a lot of stuff. We didn't even get the Apple wearables. But after that, you're right. Then we're out of topics. I just have one item, I guess. Uh, it was a popular item, but just one. Uh, last week, we were talking about how if you have some sort of service that uh, deals with your photos and lets you share them, no matter what cool features you have, you got to at least also have a way to send a link to somebody they can view in any web browser. And we also talked about photo stream and iOS integration and stuff like that. Uh, and although we didn't come out and say it directly, the implication was that photo stream did not have a public URL, but photo stream does have public URLs. You can make a little URL for our website that you can share with somebody that lets them see the pictures in your photo stream. Um, I use photo stream with my family and my family all has iOS devices. And the great thing about that is it notifies you on your phone or on your iPad. And when you get the notification, you can just swipe and see the pictures immediately. It's, it's, it's a much superior interface for viewing pictures, but you've always got to have that web interface underneath it all. And this came up in the context of carousel, which I think Casey, you said they didn't have a way for you to just get an easy web link. That was my experience. That's correct. So I had emailed what was to carousel a completely random email address that wasn't associated with the Dropbox account. The email address, in fact, was my work email. And when I received the email from personal me, and I'm doing that in air quotes, to work me, the work email basically said, hey, you need to install carousel if you want to do anything useful. And I think it did have uh, like six or seven pictures in it, little little thumbnails of the pictures that I'd actually selected. So it wasn't like stock photography or anything like that. But with that said, it didn't sh it didn't do anything, and there was no web based link. It basically said, "Go to the app or get the hell out of here." So, do we have any more follow up? Any, any of you, Casey? Do you feel like you need to follow up at all about any <laughs> uh, any topics from last week? Or is that <laughs> do you know what you did, Casey? Do you want to tell us all what you did? <laughs> I'm sorry, Daddy. No, um, I I don't know. I'm I'm a little not bitter. I'm a little frustrated with the feedback from last week, and I was debating talking about it. And since you've prompted me, I'll go ahead and do so, and just make my world even worse for myself. And the thing that frustrated me about the feedback we received is that there were a few instances, and uh, Mark Edwards is from Bajango, Django, I always pronounce it wrong, I'm so sorry, Mark. But anyway, he wrote a relatively long missive that he put up on, as a gist, a gist, whatever. What am I thinking of? Gist. Thank you. I, I doubted myself. Anyways, I'm all out of whack. So he put up a gist, and, um, and he explained as someone who used to do this sort of thing for a living, why vinyl is basically the most evil thing in the world. And while I don't entirely agree with what he said, I can't really factually debate it. And so things like that, and we'll, we'll put a link in the show notes, that was actually welcome and useful. Um, but I got a lot of feedback. We got a lot of feedback, and I got a lot of feedback, which basically amounted to, I read something on the internet once, it must be true, you're crazy and stupid. And that kind of bothers me a little bit because it was oftentimes not really based in fact, or sometimes it was, but never, ever, ever based in experience. And I'm not going to try to rehash the argument, but suffice to say, I put a lot more stock when I receive feedback from someone who has had the experience of listening to vinyl on a really nice setup over someone who has just read some things or seen some stuff on the internet and swears that that's true. Now, yes, there's a lot of science behind it. Yes, I understand that. Yes, I'm probably crazy. All of that is fine. I agree. I understand it. It was probably silly of me to say that the fidelity of vinyl was better than the fidelity of, of CDs. But and when it comes down to it, something I uh, said on Twitter, which I actually is fairly proud of myself, I'm patting myself on the back, is that it, it's very kind of cliche, but life is what happens between one and zero in my eyes. And whether or not the accuracy of the reproduction on vinyl or CD is better, I just happen to prefer the feel and to some degree, the, the what do you call it? The tea something? I, I already forgot. Tea ceremony. In Japanese tea ceremony? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Google it. Yeah, no, I, I know what you mean. So I prefer the tea ceremony of it. And the only thing I will say to defend myself, other than come at me once you've had personal experience, you damn nerds, uh, the only other thing I'll say is, why is it, John, that you choose to drive a manual transmission in 2014? That's not even close to a fair comparison. 
I was I was gonna let you slide, but you come you come back at me with this, and you just like what, what I was gonna let slide is the ter- that thing with life is what happens between one and zero that like that vaguely alludes to terrible illogical reasoning behind crazy you know what i mean like i know that's not what you're getting at at all like i understand but the fact that you chose to use one and zero is like another nudge at like the come on guys we all know that digital stuff is just cold, cold, <laughs> cold, cold and unfeeling and uh and now, <laughs> know you know what i mean like this isn't do, do. that but then you came at the other thing like i found the feedback frustrating as well and you would think i wouldn't find the feedback frustrating because i think that most of the feedback agreed with marco and i but i found the feedback very frustrating because uh, I mean, this is this is a common phenomenon in feedback for the show. Very often, we will get feedback, no matter what the topic, uh, on, on past shows and everything, where someone will be. I mean, this is not bad feedback; it's good because it shows enthusiasm. You know, if someone who's a big fan of the show will write in, and th- this is, in some ways, this is the best kind of feedback that where they'll be like, "Listening to your show made me think about this, and here's what I think about it," and they'll present a bunch of uh, ideas about the topic. But what I find frustrating is a lot of the time, the ideas that they present are things that we talked about on the show. And you don't want to write back and say, yeah, we talked about that, this exact thing at, at length on the show. But then it sounds like you're not valuing their feedback and it's good that they're enthusiastic about it. But sometimes it's frustrating to see, like, I fail, I obviously failed to communicate this idea because it keeps coming back to me as if it's information that we are missing or if it's new information or, or new insights. And it's like, we talked about it for 15 minutes. We, we said almost these exact words. And it's like, sometimes it's people sometimes it's people sending feedback in real time where they listen and then I guess they pause it or whatever. And then they write their, you know, three-page missive and then they start playing again. And then, you know, <laughs> because they haven't gotten to the end of the podcast and realized we addressed the point. And that happens with tweets, you know, obviously that's fine. Sometimes it happens with emails too. But a lot of the feedback was like, presenting points back to any of us me marco you that that i thought i could swear we covered on the show like we talked about these exact things and it's like maybe we're not communicating effectively or or just like we're, we're, we're talking past our audience or something uh and in the same way i saw a lot of arguments directed at both casey and us that i thought we talked about on the show and addressed all different sides of coming back at us in, in you know and uh, arguments that i thought i had you know uh, refuted and settled down arguments that Casey never made arguments that we never made positions that we never staked out just you know the whole nine yards like this is obviously a very fraught uh issue and I think Casey the problem you're still having with it and, and the problem I think you'll continue to have with it is that you just gotta like you, you have to just make it clear what it is like you know it's, it's like in in the world of internet debate it's like moving the goalposts. so you gotta make it clear what everybody's talking about because at this point I think everybody uh, on this podcast all agrees it's just that you keep wanting to put the goalposts over there and pretend that's what we were talking about and me and Marco keep wanting to put the goalposts over here and pretend this is what we're talking about <laughs> and and the original and I'm trying to keep them kind of where the original thing was which was the whole idea uh, on, on IRL talk where Faith said I'm not going to buy a device that purports to have high quality music. And you're right. Fidelity is a better word. It was pointed out to us by Dr. Drang. We should have been using that word, which could be part of the communication problem here. But anyway, I'm not going to buy a device like the Pono because if I want high quality, meaning high fidelity music, I'll just listen to vinyl. And that I think is a clear, uh, you know, a a clear implication that like we're talking about the Pono and the whole big deal with that is like there is, you know, there's more information in the music. And it's like, well, if I want more information in the music, if I want higher fidelity, if I want a more accurate reproduction of sound, I will go to vinyl. And you you seem to follow down that trail. And um, uh, my objection and Marco's objection is that like, you know, vinyl is not good at reproducing sound and not as good as CD. And all those other stuff, I think, were great for us to talk about. And it's good to define the boundaries of what we believe in everything. But, like, you should be happy with that. It's not as if we, like, it, it's it's not as if you should, uh, you shouldn't cling to that idea, like that fidelity thing. If that's not what you're talking about, then fine. Then you agree with us there, and we agree with you right. over the tea ceremony, and everybody's right. happy. And the, the, one of the things that it, it keeps getting thrown back in is, like, that, I like to ref- I'd like to reframe a lot of these people's arguments, and the popular one is like if if I said, "Look, if I'm really interested in high fidelity images, I'll go to Instagram." Like that, that's the effectively the argument they're making. Like you know, I don't need a full frame uh, camera with with a really great sensor and lots of megapixels. If I'm interested in photographic fidelity, I will look at a camera phone picture from 1992 on Instagram. Like, that's the argument that many people are making, and uh, unknowingly that they're making, that they're completely combining what they think looks good, which may be like a super grainy Instagram filter, and the concept of fidelity, which is a straightforward thing that can be measured and talked about in in objective terms, more or less. 
And yeah. people coming back with like, I love tube amps and everything like that, you know, instead of digital amps, like that's not what we're talking about. It's like, whatever, whatever it is that you think sounds good, all we're talking about is given that sound that I probably made a mistake using live instruments because then I had to deal with all the people talking about live music. G given, some sound that, <laughs> given some sound that you think is awesome, what is the best way to transport that sound through space and time to reproduce it elsewhere? That's all we're talking about. It has nothing to do with whether you like tube amps or solid state amps, whether you like six string guitars or five string, whether you like someone singing through a paper bag or not, whatever the sound is, you've produced a sound, a song, live, recorded, or whatever. You want to get that across space and time to someone else. You want to put it on something so that that sound that you love can get to them exactly as it is. Does it have whatever that sound is? Master it however you want, do whatever you want. How do you get that sound? CD versus vinyl. That's what we were talking about. Everything else is like immaterial. I don't care if you like the sound of someone singing through a paper bag. Oh, I care, oh, oh, no, no, now I'm talking about vinyl. Like, I don't care if you like Tom Waits. I don't care, you know, what kind of music you want. I'm just saying, you have you have something there. And again, live music was easy because it's like, oh, I hear that now. You just want to put that on something so it could be played back elsewhere. And if your choices are CD and vinyl and you care about the fidelity of that reproduction, you should pick CD instead of vinyl. And that's it. And everything else people want to talk about it's it's so hard for them to maintain focus. So it was hard for us to maintain focus because we kept drifting. But it's a difficult topic to talk about, I think. Yeah, and I think you're right. And I think I, I think you're right in saying that we all agree that if if fidelity is truly the issue, that I, I can get behind the science, even though I give it a little bit of side eye. Nevertheless, I can get behind the science that says I'm crazy, and that digital mediums are the better higher fidelity method of reproducing music. But just as you said, I actually happen to prefer the tea ceremony, the emotion behind it. Like I was talking to my wife, Erin, about it, and she said, well, you know, you have to consider you grew up with vinyl, and this was something that had that carries a lot of emotional baggage. And I think John, or one of you guys might have said that last week. Anyway, uh, it carries a lot of emotional baggage that for most humans, especially in this day and age, they don't have that emotional baggage. And I say baggage actually in a good way in this context. I'm sure you probably think of it as a bad thing. But nevertheless, I don't know. What, but one thing I learned from this, and I'm really being serious, is that it is very frustrating to say something which admittedly is a bit contrarian. And admittedly, I had kind of picked this fight. So admittedly, I kind of made this bed for myself. But man, is it frustrating to say something that you truly believe, and then the whole of the internet decides to come out and tell you how wrong you are. And that in and of itself, I can deal with that. That's fine. I've, I've been wrong plenty of times. I'll be wrong plenty of times again. But it was very frustrating for me to receive a whole bunch of feedback from people who had perhaps never even heard vinyl before in their lives, yet decided to take the time out of their day to explain to me how wrong I am. And I actually want, I, I'm twisting this, not, I, I don't want that to sound like a complaint. What I want it to sound like is I learned a little bit that I think I do that to people sometimes. And I can't think of a great example other than maybe snickering at somebody pulling out an Android phone, for example. But let me get that for you. Yeah, well, I don't I don't want to be that guy. And I think I am that guy. And it's so it was a very good learning experience for me that I need to stop being that guy. Does does that make sense? Yeah, I, I think I don't know. I mean, if, you know, we're always gonna get oh god, I have so much more to say about this, but I'm trying to resist. I <laughs> we're we're always gonna get um you know, people who disagree with what we say. We always do every week. I mean, every, we get, yep, yep. you know, to give the listener some idea, we get probably, I would say, 20 feedback emails a day these days. It's a lot. I, I, I'm shocked how much feedback we get uh, from this show. And I should qu very quickly interject and say, I can't speak for you two, but I try very hard to read every single piece and at worst skim every single piece of feedback that we get. Yeah, me too. And and it's it really does like when you only get like a couple a week, um that's easy to keep up with. Now it's getting hard to keep up with. Like it's it's getting we get so much feedback now that it's kind of difficult uh, cuz some of them, you know, some of them are a few lines and that that's great. Some of them are like six paragraphs. Uh it's six dense paragraphs at that and and those like it takes some serious time to get through some of these. Uh but anyway, um you know, I I think we we are expressing our opinions in public. Uh, lots of what we say is going to be argued with. That's just the nature of putting yourself out there. Um, right, right. You know, like, I like, I mean, I've, I've been putting myself out there and my, and my often rash or incorrect or badly stated opinions uh, out there online for uh, the better part of a decade now, uh, pretty consistently. And 
whenever I say something that everyone jumps down my throat for for being totally wrong or off base or ma- or misinformed or just just not very well stated, uh, I learn something from that, and and I appreciate that because most people don't expose themselves to that much criticism. Most people don't have an audience to tell them when they're wrong and who actually will tell them when they're wrong and and an audience that's big and diverse and smart enough to notice when they're wrong and to be able to express that in any kind of useful way. Um, So most people tend to be terrible arguers, have narrow worldviews, et cetera, et cetera. And it's, it's, it's hard to, uh, to get people to change their mind when they've spent their whole life thinking that they're right. And no one has really ever challenged them on that. So I'm very thankful that we have the opportunity, which most people don't have. We we as podcasters and anyone else who's a podcaster or a blogger or any other way that you can put yourself out there, uh, we are lucky that we have the opportunity to be criticized by a massive worldwide audience. Uh, Even if your audience is 25 people, that's still 25 random strangers who don't care as much about how you feel as your family does and who are willing to tell you uh, when you screw something up. And you know, as the audience gets larger, it hurts more when you screw up because you have more people telling you that you're an idiot. But uh, I think it it is useful and it's useful. And so like in your case, you know, as John said, like in your case, you have, you know, with with the vinyl thing, like you expressed valid opinions there. However, you worded them in a way and you made a generalization that you couldn't support. And so the feedback kept beating that into your head basically (laughs) and it's true and and it's you know it certainly was not uh certainly was not probably easy to read everyone saying that you were wrong although by the way there are a lot of people who agree with you i should point out um but like your main your main point was that it sounds better because it sounded better to you Mm -hmm. a solid argument would have been you like the sound better Right. And I, and I think I fell on my face because I painted it, like John was saying and like you're saying now, I painted it as a universal statement when I really shouldn't have, that it was factually better, that it, it was superior to CDs. And while I might prefer the experience and the, and the quirks of the sound, I don't think that I should have gone as bold as I did. Yeah, and as one of the feedback things, actually a couple of people did this, like presented, if, if we could just take that sound that you love, and record it onto CD and play it back to you in a way that you didn't know whether we were playing back the vinyl or not, you you would not be able to tell. Like, we would be exactly accurate that you're producing that vinyl sound that you love with every nuance that's available. You know what I mean? Like, and that's that gets to the heart of the matter. And it's like, we're all for you liking whatever sound you like. But like, when we're talking about, when we talk about mediums, when we just say the word vinyl, you're not talking about a song or a sound, you're talking about a medium. And that's and that's a, a different topic. There's so many different ways you try to come at this to try to get people to understand it. Let us keep going back to whichever side they're on, whether they're like, no way, man, vinyl is awesome or like vinyl is always evil. Like people just don't want to define the boundaries of what it is that they're saying. And it's impossible to come to any sort of agreement or disagreement if if no one is defining the boundaries of what they're saying. And a lot of like, especially the tweet length ones, which you can't blame. It's hard to hard to talk about this in a single tweet. Uh, fell victim to that, both uh, you know, on on all sides of the debate. Or the best ones where they say, "I like the tweets on any topic." Where they'll say, I, "I agree with Casey about this. I agree with Marco about this. I disagree with John about this." And it's they will ascribe to all three of us opinions that, like that. Fifty percent of the time, we didn't take. And it's like so, you know. I, I, <laughs> I agree with Marco that, that Starbucks coffee is great. I agree with Casey that all cars should be black, and I agree with John that Pearl is a terrible language. You know, that's a, a silly example, but it's like. You put our names in a tweet, and you've expressed your own opinions, but you've you've by implication ascribed the opposite opinions to us, and I don't think we ever. Anyway, it's it's the excitement of feedback. I agree with Marco. Get, getting this feedback, as I've said many times, is very valuable. We're lucky to get a lot of it. You too can get a lot of it as well if you just go to online communities and whatever topic you're interested in, and just start. You know, like I said, Usenet in my past, where it wasn't it wasn't as big as audience as we have here. But it doesn't take, you know, it only takes like four or five mean people to put you in your place for a couple of years and you'll you'll get better. Great. Yeah. And, and again, I don't I don't mean to complain necessarily about getting feedback. I don't mean to complain about uh, all of the Internet or most of the Internet thinking I'm wrong. That actually doesn't bother me. What was frustrating was people who really didn't have, in, to be blunt, anything that constructive to add just coming out of the woodwork and saying, eh, you're wrong. 
and you're wrong because I read something once. That's just not helpful. Whereas something that Mark did, which he said, okay, from personal experience, let me take you through why it is you're wrong. That is infinitely valuable and extraordinarily valuable. And I'm very thankful for that. But the other people are expressing their enthusiasm though. Like even if they're, they're, they're doing it in a way that makes you feel bad, they are, they're saying, A, we listened to the show and B, we were enthusiastic enough about it to seek you out on Twitter and send you something. So there are, there is even good in that, I think. Yeah, I agree. And that's why even on the emails that I want to reach to the computer and backhand whoever wrote them, <laughs> even on those emails, I try always to force myself to end the email in such a way that when I write, thank you for listening and thanks for your feedback, that it's taken as genuine because I do mean it genuinely, even if I want to freaking kill whoever it is I just replied to. So I don't know. Maybe this is too inside baseball. This might be boring. Maybe we'll cut it. I don't know. But it, it just... The point I was trying to get to was that it made me look at myself with a bit of a critical eye, which, again, is even more reason why even the feedback that I'm bemoaning is actually valuable in its own way. And and to point out also, uh, I actually – so I, I've been in this high-end audio world for a, a lot recently, and I found that – like so the reason why I don't like vinyl – and and a lot of analog technology. Same reason why I I briefly had had a chance to uh, to have a tube amp in my house for a couple of weeks to try out, and I didn't like it, and I ended up not buying one. Um, and the reason why people like vinyl sound, not everyone, but the reason why the people who do like it like it. In addition to all the things we talked about last week about the tea ceremony and and the romanticism of it, and how hip and awesome it looks, and everything is slow and artisanal and manual. Um, in addition to all that crap, it does sound different. And it sounds different in, in various ways that people find pleasing. Now, as, but you know, that wasn't the argument that John was making against you. Uh, however, that was what most people thought when, you know, with, with, for the argument about vinyl sounding better than CD or whatever. Um, you know, in my own purchases and, and what I found in my experiences with high end audio stuff. What I like is neutrality in most cases. So, for instance, I don't use a tube amp because I use sensitive headphones. And sensitive headphones, you can very easily pick up the noise introduced by tube amps. You can also occasionally get like a little pop as if a piece of dust hits the wrong way or something like that. Like, it's just not... It is... It, it's it's almost like, like records, you know. It's almost like vinyl. It, it's not... You're introducing distortion. You're introducing noise. So I try to get very, very nice digital stuff. So everything is solid state. There's, there's, you know, no moving parts except the volume knob. Um, there is as little noise introduced as possible, and there is as little, you know, tonal imbalance introduced as possible. And I actually took it a little too far. So my my current setup is. I have the Sennheiser HD800 headphones plugged into uh, the shit Asgard 2, that is actually its name, <laughs> and the uh, shit Bifrost uh, DAC. And it looks amazing. These things all look fancy and awesome. They sound great. Um, but the main reason I like the shit amp and DAC is because they, they have like zero noise that I can hear on anything that I have. It's not because they're the shit. It, well, and the name helps too, and they look pretty awesome. And they're, they're small, and they were reasonably priced. Um, and I like it because it's super neutral. Now, the Sennheiser HD 800 headphones, the best thing I can say about them is that they are the most neutral headphones I've ever heard. The downside of this is that they actually sound a little bit boring on certain things. So, like, certain types of music, I actually like the distortion by things like amplifying the high end that you hear on some uh, biodynamic models or, um... Or the more the bigger bass I have on my closed headphones, the uh, TH nine hundreds, and certain things I like that distortion. Now, throughout throughout all my research and finding these headphones, I actually I tried a few other models. I ended up returning or selling in the meantime, and I found that people's opinions varied dramatically on what they considered sounding good. So, one of the most popular lines, the Sennheiser HD six hundred and six fifty, those actually have pretty muted high end, and. I didn't like that sound. A lot of people loved it. And similarly, like so certain people don't like the biodynamic, super strong high end. And I like it. And what I found is that 
you know, he's keeping everything neutral up until the point of the actual headphones allowing me to make that choice gives me the flexibility. Like, you can simulate all the other... You can simulate vinyl with digital plugins and equalizers and stuff. Please email Dan. Um, (laughs) (laughs) You can simulate most of the the effects of, of what people like about these things electronically and artificially if you want to just like instagram you know can uh you know can simulate the the distortions of certain old processes or things that you know or like idealized or enhanced versions of old processes and old distortions that used to exist in the analog world and that produces more pleasing looking photos to to a lot of people so it's important to recognize like you know i like i like everything to be digital and pure and clean and neutral up until the point where I have my headphones where I can make that choice and say either I want to listen to something with a lot of bass with this pair of headphones or I want to listen to something that's neutral with this pair of headphones. And I recognize that's a crazy setup. However, that's how I am and that's how I did it. But that, you know, none of that, like the argument John was making last week is that CDs are, are better at being neutral. They're better at accurately and neutrally replicating the recording. And that's, that is correct. That is 100% right. Um, and... Most people, though, when they're arguing about what sounds better or worse or what is better or worse, they don't put it in those terms of personal preference or of, like, the difference between neutrality and pleasing sound. Because that's a, those, those are very different things. Perfectly neutral sounds boring to a lot of people. Like, when I edit our podcast, I edit with perfectly neutral. However, when I listen to Fish, I like a little bit more bass. So when I listen to Fish, I put on the other headphones. You know, it's, it's very important to distinguish those things personal preference or more pleasing versus accurate and neutral. Yeah, I think you're right. But I don't know. This is probably getting a bit old now. Why don't you tell us about something that's cool? I would love to. It's our friends at PDF Pen. Once again, this is PDF Pen for iPad. PDF Pen for iPad lets you edit PDFs anywhere you are, as long as you have an iPad with you that happens to be running PDF Pen. However, anywhere you are with one of those things, you can edit PDFs. You can sign contracts, you can fix a typo, you can actually edit the PDF right there on your device, you can correct a price list, you can fill out a form while you're on the go, and uh, you can take PDF documents with you anytime, add notes, highlighting, add markup during your mobile downtime. You can sync PDFs with PDF Pen for OS X uh, using iCloud or Dropbox, because PDF Pen is for OS X and iPad. You can grab and save PDFs using Dropbox, Evernote, Google Drive, Box. I guess it isn't called Box.net anymore. Is that right? They dropped the .net, now it's just Box. Anyway, you can save PDFs to that uh, or from that. Uh, Even WebDAV and FTP servers. Um, And anywhere you are with PDF Pen for iPad, you have the complete feature-rich mobile editing power of PDF Pen. Uh, It's available in the App Store. Now, a lot of apps these days, this is, I've been meaning to talk about this, a lot of apps these days haven't even been updated for iOS 7 yet. They're not native. They, you know, they're kind of ignored. PDF Pen is awesome. It is always updated. It is native to iOS 7. Um, and there's tons of, they're always making tons of improvements, performance improvements, everything else. They're fantastic. Um, and it syncs all your stuff. Once again, uh, they even support a few of the uh, pressure-sensitive pens on the market, uh, the most popular ones. They, they support the Jot Touch, the Pogo Connect, and the Jaja or Haha, I'm not sure what, which one is that is, but it's J-A-J-A, that one, which is either Jaja or Haha, or maybe Jaha or Haja, who knows. But they support that one. Uh, so check out PDF Pen for iPad. Go to smilesoftware.com slash ATP. That is smilesoftware.com slash ATP. Thanks a lot to PDF Pen for iPad uh, for sponsoring our show once again. Um, I, I'll tell you, I... I uh, use PDF Pen and it's fantastic. It, it has I use it more on the Mac than the iPad just because that's where I am most of the time. But it's boy, it's it's an amazing piece of software and it, it saves my butt pretty frequently. So uh, thanks a lot to PDF Pen for iPad once again. We didn't get a chance to talk about last week because we were too busy arguing. Uh, we didn't get a chance to talk about this trial with Samsung between Samsung and Apple. And there's been some interesting things coming out of this, and we've gotten to look at some of the behind the scenes at how Apple does stuff, how they get their jobs done as, as a result of a lot of the discovery during the trial. So I don't know, John, do you have any thoughts on this? Yeah, I picked out in particular, not so much the details of the trial or whatever, because 
Doesn't this one have to do with patents too? I don't I don't even pay attention, but you know how I, I feel think about, so. about patents or whatever. But yeah, because as part of the discovery process or some other legal term that I don't know, uh, they're revealing internal documents from uh, Apple. And it's great because Apple is, well, it's great for us anyway. I don't know if it's great for Apple. That's all the discussion. But uh, we get so little insight into what goes on in Apple. We just see their public face and their public face is so incredibly controlled. And I think it's even more controlled now than it used to be because as we've said uh, many times before, in the good old days with Steve Jobs, yes, Apple's message was controlled, but Steve Jobs had the ability and often took it to just go off book and do whatever the hell he wants and say whatever the hell he wants in whatever way he wants. And I'm sure he was, uh, you know, controlled and calculating as well, but you never quite knew what he was going to say. Tim Cook, you're not going to make him slip up and say something. You're not going to get something exciting. And so far, it seems like he is very on message and very controlled, strategically leaking things and saying things in a certain way and choosing his words very carefully. But with Steve Jobs, you felt like there was a chance he might, you know, either act like he's just suddenly caught up in the moment and saying something spontaneous or, or actually do that. Uh, but anyway, these documents are internal Apple documents. And uh, from the outside, a lot of people say Apple is arrogant, Apple's out of touch, they don't know what their users really want or whatever. But these internal documents make it very, very clear that that is not the case, that, that it is merely the, their external face that they control so well. But internally, uh, this is the, the fiscal year 2014 planning offsite slide deck. And you can see some of these slides. Uh, if you haven't seen them, we'll put the link in the show notes. You should check them out. But I'll, I'll, I'll read off some of the slides here. So the first slide says, uh, they're talking about iPhone sales, and it says growth rates are slowing. And they show a graph that shows growth rates going down, 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 down. Apple, of course, would never show a slide like this in public because why are they going to you know show something uh, that puts them in a bad light uh and again something as simple as this showing growth rate slowing yes you'll see stories about apple about that and if someone actually gets in touch with apple and asks them about that they'll say some you know blah 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 kind of well we think we're you know on the right track and blah blah blah, blah we're working on you know they'll say some stupid pr thing but here they are saying when they're talking to themselves they're like here's the graph growth rate is really slowing Next slide, they say, so what's going on? And they have little sections here that says, strongest demand is coming from less expensive and larger screen smartphones. Carriers have strong interest in, in capping iPhone due to one or more factors. High share, the subsidy premium, unfriendly policy, unfriendly is in, in quotes, lack of alignment. So they're basically saying, uh, cu customers want cheaper phones with bigger screens. Carriers, carriers don't like us that much. And they don't like us for good reasons, because we are more demanding of them, because we, you know these unfriendly policies that we have, our subsidy is really high, uh, lack of alignment with, you know, their, our interests aren't aligned with the carriers, you know, they're, they're basically laying out, yeah, carriers don't like us that much, and competitors, and they show the little Android icon, competitors have drastically improved their hardware and software, software and their ecosystems. And then spending obscene, also in scare quotes, amounts of money on advertising and carrier channel to gain traction, which is a Samsung thing. So they're laying out, like, we're, here, here are our problems. We're kind of getting our butt kicking these areas. Here's what people want. And, and this is the title of the slide. is great. Next slide. Consumers want what we don't have. If <laughs> you can imagine Apple saying that in public, what we don't have. And so they show, like... Uh, the market share growth and they said where did the growth come from and this i i'm a, i wish there was a better breakdown and maybe there was but they're saying where did the growth in the industry come from and it shows the growth and it says uh i don't can't do the percentages here but more than half the growth came from phones that are less than 300 dollars, and the rest of the growth came from screens that are more than 300 dollars, but have screens that are bigger than four inches the re the objection i have to this graph is Okay, great. You have identified that that the majority of the growth is coming from phones that are less than three hundred dollars. I think you need to break that down more, because if you take that piece and say, okay, well, out of that growth, actually ninety nine percent of that growth is coming from phones that are less than five dollars. That is way different than saying, okay, well, most of it's coming from how much less than three hundred dollars. Break it down. Is it is it you know what's the average? How what's the distribution in there? Without knowing that, you don't know what to do. But anyway, this is a high level slide. So I take I assume they have broken it down internally. I just again, I would like to see that broken down. I didn't. Um, and all this reminded me of a book I'm reading now, which I would recommend to everybody and we'll put a link in the show notes. It's Ed Catmull's book called Creativity Inc. Uh, it's, it's not really a memoir or manifesto. It's more of just an explanation of the early history of Pixar and what Ed Catmull and uh, the rest of the company has done to uh, to make that organization function and be successful. And a big focus on the book is being 
clear eyed about your own problems and candid about them internally. Um, and I know Pixar is not Apple and I know Steve Jobs didn't have nearly as much involvement in Pixar as he did in Apple, but I can't help but see parallels, uh, between the, you know, the things that are in this book and the approach Apple is taking here. Apple is very clear eyed in these slides. They are not sugarcoating it. They are not like rah, 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 like, yeah, we may have problems, but we still have the best phone is in this office. The, the, the slides are just, you know, there's not a lot of them, but they're essentially unrelentingly negative towards Apple. And, you know, that's how they have to be. That's, that's how Apple improves. So I felt better about seeing these slides and it made me think that at least some of the culture and uh, strategies described in uh, that excellent book by Ed Catmull are alive and well in Apple as well. Yeah, I think it is, it's fantastic to see that Apple knows its own problems. It knows its own shortcomings. But I think that's not really that much news necessarily. Um, to me, seeing all these, like, seeing all these trial documents and like the emails of Phil Schiller and everything, uh, it really just says to me that this company is, you know, by being as private as they usually are, they are saving us from the boredom and the and the the uh, relative routineness that's actually in their company. This these are like the only big surprise here is that these people are actually acting somewhat human, but they're all you know they're saying not that surprising things. They're sending boring business emails to their advertising agency that doesn't even capitalize anything, which is apparently a thing. Well, that was that was a whole other thing. Like the, the Phil Schiller, like this article was supposed to be, you know, sensational or whatever. And so one of the things they showed was, look at this email where Phil Schiller is being angry to his ad agency. And what I took away from that exchange was how incredibly low the bar is for Apple's <laughs> ad agency. Like yeah. you feel like this is your ad agency. You've, you're the biggest company in the world and these jokers are doing your ads. Boy, that's just depressing. Like I, I, not everything can be up to the standard of Apple and Pixar, I guess. And it's just, yeah. Yeah. I mean, what I, what I really just found with these, with these documents is like, wow, this is all really boring stuff that like it, like there's very little of, of newsworthiness here, except that, you know, Apple usually does a really good job of keeping what comes out interesting. You know, keeping their public image interesting and secretive and uh, and well edited. And you you see now on the inside that yeah, it's it's a big company dealing with big company problems and doing things that big companies do. It might not seem that novel to you, but I compare it to. Uh, I mean, I, I work for a lot of different companies, but the one people may have heard of is that for for a time I worked for Palm, and I didn't. I wasn't very close to the leadership of that organization, but internal to the company, when I worked for Palm, I got presentations from you know some of the big wigs came to visit us because we were in a different location and gave us a presentation on the state of Palm and what their plans were for the business, and their slides were not candid and didn't accurately identify the problems they were facing they were much more kind of like we're actually still doing pretty good in the pda space and the phones are coming on but we've got these trio things and like it was like even to me inside the company i'm like you guys are in denial if these are the slides we're showing this internally if we are we are showing these slides to ourselves internally we are not being honest with ourselves about the state i mean you would hope that they would you know we we saw it and we felt it and maybe they felt it it just didn't feel as honest and straightforward and uh, like if you if you don't think these apple slides are novel or interesting even, like I, I don't have that much experience in big tech companies but i have seen it from big and small most companies are not this candid with themselves and are not are not this accurate like you know are not able to exactly pinpoint where their weak points are and nail them in that way. And I guess that shows, you know, confidence internally and skill. And if they weren't that skilled, they wouldn't be where they are today. So I think there is something to it. It's not, we shouldn't just accept that every company does this because I think many of them don't. The other thing that uh, we didn't talk about last week, which we could have, is some guy that apparently I was supposed to know but didn't know is leaving Apple. And that guy is Greg Christie. And had, had either of you two heard of him before? I'm assuming, John, that you had. But but Marco, have you heard of this gentleman before last week? Nope. I still don't even believe this is really a story. Well, there was there was stories about him. He was featured in recent stories before the He Was Leaving Apple story. So even if you weren't aware of him before that, you might have said, haven't I seen that name before? And it's like, yes, like two weeks ago, you did see that name. when it was. I think someone did a story about the early days of the iPhone and he was heavily featured. Yeah, whatever. yeah. Yeah, so that's why you might be aware of him. Uh, yeah, this looks a lot like kind of a gossip story, like people arguing inside Apple and then one of them leaves. I mean, that happens all the time in every company. Um, and then, you know, from some people have 
we don't know what's really going on here, but there's at least one reasonable desi- denial from Matt Panzerino that the details of this big breakup are not as dramatic as they seem. But the reason I think it's interesting is forget about how he left or why he left or whatever. Like, who cares, right? The the uh, What it highlights, what all these stories highlight, is it's time for them to talk about kind of, oh, Johnny Ives' organization, because he is in charge of much more than he used to be in charge of. Anything that happens in that organization, people coming, people going, or whatever, uh, with him remaining at the top, in some ways, like, not that it reflects on him, but it makes us focus on him. So what these stories made me do is think more about how Johnny Ive is doing in his position. And yes, part of his position is retention or whatever, but not so much in this particular thing. But what, what it got me thinking about was, what what are Johnny Ive's weaknesses in his new role as software designer. I've had you know decades to think about what his weaknesses are in hardware design, and previously it was an unknown. What is he going to be like in software? But his organization, I guess you know, iOS seven is the first big product of his software organization, and we've all had a long time to live with it. And I think his weaknesses as a software designer are m- more glaring and obvious than they are in hardware. Maybe, and in fact, they're very similar. And so, anytime anything happens within that organization. It makes me sort of like dwell more on how he's doing uh, in his new role as software designer. Uh, And I think that's a useful avenue of thought for me. So are you not pleased with how things are going then with Johnny at the helm? Well, like when somebody leaves like that, even if it's on good terms, bad terms or whatever, like you have to think that like it's not I that's leaving, right? People under him are going to leave. If the, and you have to think like maybe there was a – it's someone who used to be more in charge than they are now, right? He used to – like he, he was largely responsible for a lot of the early iPhone UI. And surely his power to, like, to make changes and decisions has decreased now that Johnny Ive has come in above him. And you know what I mean? Like that's the whole thing with this with the reorg. Johnny Ive is given, has been given much more power. And that means the power – the people who used to have the power have had it taken away. And if there's any sort of – disagreement about what to do johnny i going to win as he should because he's in charge uh, and what that means is that whatever his strengths and weaknesses are are imprinted even more strongly on the organization because he is not just one voice anymore he is the voice as i think i tweeted at one point he's in full shiguro miyamoto mode where miyamoto designed uh nintendo's flagship games like mario and donkey kong and many other things and slowly climbed the ranks of the organization until essentially he was the buck stopped with him for all issues related to software design in all of Nintendo and possibly several aspects of hardware design as well. Like, once you are in that position of power, whatever your strengths or weaknesses are, are, are magnified. I mean, it was true with Steve Jobs. His strengths and weaknesses were magnified through the whole organization. And so now, that's why I'm dwelling on what I was like as a software designer, because these other voices, whether you agree with them or not, Scott Forstall, Greg Christie, all these other people, their voices and their ability to... Uh, you know, affect change within the organization are necessarily modified by the larger and larger footprint of this one fallible individual for better or for worse. And so that's what I've got my eye on. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, I, you know, the the problem is I, I, I think you're right that that is something to watch, but I think everything we've, everything we've heard about this, about Greg Christie's particular departure um, makes it sound like maybe, you know, maybe the problem had nothing to do with Johnny Ive. And, you know, like we, we see like the, the crazy rumor sites saying, you know, there was some kind of friction there. And then you see people like John Gruber, who have generally better sources on these kind of things, uh, saying, oh, this was actually, you know, in the works for months. And he didn't even, this wasn't even recent. And there was no bad blood. He just was retiring. Uh, and it, as the story gets older, we're hearing more that it's not a story than the very minute that it broke in the news that said it was a story. So it, that's probably the reality. It probably is not a story in itself. Now, again, you're right that this is something, you know, Johnny Ive having a lot more power than he used to and becoming so powerful that, that he's able to get bad decisions through, uh, that is something to watch, no question. And iOS 7 is a great example of some of those things. You know, I, I think iOS 7 really showed that Johnny Ive was wanting to make a big a big change in a lot of very important stuff on iOS and he did and he went a little too far in a lot of those changes but even you know as we saw last summer even from beta 1 to what was released as 
there were a lot of changes to rein some of that back. Like the, the biggest one being the super thin font was replaced with a more reasonably thick thickness one, <laughs> more reasonably weighted one. Uh, you know, things like that. I think there were, uh, the, and the, the lock screen having modifications to make it easier to realize that you have to swipe right and not up. Uh, things like that. You know, there were a lot of, uh, or is it left? I don't know. Anyway, there were a lot of changes made. You know, he went too far and then he dialed it back. And, I think iOS 7 is great. I think the design of it is great. It is not perfect, but it is great. And it is a massive improvement over 6. So, and this this is going to get into, you know, what we want from iOS 8, I guess. But uh, which I don't know if we even have that as a topic. But, again, I, I think this is something to watch for, you know, watch for Johnny Ive getting enough power that he can get bad decisions pushed through and for him to think that these decisions are good. You know, those things are a problem together. But other than that, I don't really think this is much of a story. Like, on this particular story, it doesn't, like, what I was getting at, it doesn't matter how or why Greg Christie left. It only matters that he was somebody who was there for a long time, who was responsible for a lot of, like, he was a senior person, right? He wasn't just some other person. He was another voice, whether he agreed with Johnny Ive or not at any point. If if you are, like, the last, the last, you know, Godzilla standing, like all the other big guys have left, all the other people who were there from the beginning, who strongly influenced the original iPhone, you know what I mean? Like, that's what I was saying about, like, uh, Shigeru Miyamoto. Like, you need to have those voices that, that you will listen to because you believe, like, that they are valuable and have experience. And even if he just left because he just felt like retiring, right? That's that's a loss. That's that's somebody that you don't have in the organization with a wealth of experience for you to bounce your ideas off of. And you know what I mean? Like, I don't get back to the Ed Catmull book again, but they have this whole chapter on the, the brain trust, which maybe we'll put a link to this because I think they did an excerpt on some website somewhere where they will get the people, the sort of the oldest and wisest people together in a room and have them all tell each other what's wrong with their with their projects uh, just to bounce ideas over because they all respect each other and they all have a lot of experience and. Any time a senior person leaves, uh, in you know, in the similar role like the senior software designer for iOS in the past, that is a loss for the company, and that's why I get like, it doesn't matter who cares why he left; he's not there anymore, and that will only serve to magnify the good and the bad about Ive. And like, I would rather see him surrounded by senior, more senior people that he respected. Uh, to you know to not not to temper his output but perhaps even to enhance the parts that are good about it it's not like they have to disagree with him maybe they should more vehemently agree with him in certain areas where he's doubting himself like that dynamic is what i what i think is lost when uh senior people leave yeah the other thing that i'm a little concerned about just on based completely on theory is johnny getting spread a little thin and i would hope that he has his trusted minions slash you know advisors or whatever to to take a lot of the day-to-day off of his plate but based on no facts and just a bunch of assumptions it seems to me that johnny is a fairly hands-on guy and if he's a hands-on guy and presumably already had a full plate with hardware alone i just can't imagine and now adding all of software onto that already overflowing plate and still being able to be good at your job, good at not only your existing job of hardware, but also good at this new job of software, which really, in the strictest sense, he doesn't have any real experience or education in. So that kind of concerns me a bit that he'll be spread too thin over over the next few years. Well, see, but that's the thing, that distinction, if you were to ask Johnny Ive, I'm going to play Johnny Ive now because I read a book about him once. Uh, if, you, if you, we had him on the podcast, I bet what he would say is this distinction between hardware and software is an artificial one that has no bearing on the experience of using the product. It's all one and the yeah. same part of the same product. Like, and it makes perfect sense to, for them to be under the same umbrella because that, that separation and that sort of arguing between them, like, yes, there is a tension technically, but that doesn't matter to the end product. It has to be one thing. I think it's perfectly valid to have that that approach that holistic approach to the product and apple has always had it it's just that now it's literally embodied within one person and yes it's a danger of that and that maybe there was healthy tension between hardware and software but i don't worry about him being spread too thin because i think he is fulfilling sort of the steve jobs type role of set the direction be tastemaker 
uh, give thumbs up, thumbs down. He's not the in there drawing you eyes and, you know, <laughs> one at a time or whatever. Like, you know what I mean? He's, he's got a staff. He's got people who do that. But in the end, the buck stops with him. And if he really wants it to be a super skinny font on a white background, that's what it's going to be. And like Marco said, some, you know, if you have to dial it back, fine. In many ways, it's better to go to go too big and then scale it back than to be too timid. You know what I mean? Uh, so I, I'm not giving him like a bad grade or anything. I'm just I'm just watching it because I would rather see ideas have to fight for their life uh, as hard as possible inside Apple, and only the best ones make it out, than to sort of slide towards a situation where there's not enough there's not there's not enough people with skills even close to Johnny Ive for him to uh, do good work in the software area. Like in the hardware area, I don't know what's going on back there, and we don't know those people as well. And I think he has a trusted team that doesn't have a lot of turnover. But in the software area, he's lost lost Scott Forstall, which through what we think actually was a disagreement, and Greg Christie uh, is now gone. Like I would, I would be happier if both of those people were still there and working in concert with Johnny Ive. But you know, what can you do? Well, you know, maybe the hardware stuff will just be a lot less work now because that you can just look at like what HP and Samsung are making and just just do stuff that looks like that, right? I think it's the opposite. It doesn't doesn't work the other way. <laughs> <laughs> you know, another thing that I should point out, and I am not through listening to it yet, but on uh, Guy English's and Renee Ritchie's really great podcast, Debug, on episode 33, we'll put a link to that in the show notes, uh, they had Ken Ferry on who did, uh, apparently was kind of the primary guy behind Auto Layout. And I'm only about two thirds of the way through the episode, but it's really, really good. And one of the things that Ken talks about is kind of, what it's like to to get an idea through Apple, you know. So he, I don't, I didn't hear the auto layout specific part yet, but just for the sake of argument, you know, I go in there, I come up with the idea for auto layout, and apparently he basically only has to convince his immediate supervisor, or at least that that's what I gleaned from it. And I just thought that was really, really interesting that it's not very bureaucratic. It's not that you have to convince 3000 people all the way up the chain. And I'm sure that that's, that is the case sometimes, but generally for, for some things you can just convince one man or woman and that's all it takes. And I just thought that was fascinating. We are also sponsored this week, once again, by New Relic. New Relic is an all-in-one web application performance management tool. Uh, apparently, there's an acronym for that, and it's APM. Uh, New Relic lets you see performance from the end-user experience through servers down to each line of your server-side code. Uh, New Relic asks us to take a minute and say a big thank you to all the data nerds out there building all this great stuff that we all know and love. They would like to send a shout-out to developers, software geeks, code jockeys, to the brave few who see things differently. Uh, here's to working nights, to wearing oversized concentration-enhancing headphones upon your furrowed brows. New Relic thanks you. The entire internet thanks you. Nowadays, if you're in any business, you're in the software business. Software powers our apps, runs our databases, manages our accounts, and runs e-commerce sites and email programs. When software breaks, everyone loses. New Relic helps improve your software performance so your users have a better experience and your business is more successful. How is that for a win-win? New Relic monitors every move your application makes across the entire stack. It can show you what's happening right now in your app. You can zero in on problems quickly with transaction tracing, SQL and no SQL performance analytics, application topology mapping, and deployment history markers and comparisons. Go to newrelic.com slash ATP and you can sign up for a free 30-day trial. Then you, all you got to do is deploy their agent on your server. It natively supports Ruby, PHP, Java, .NET, Python, and even Node.js. It'll start collecting data immediately, and then you can quickly see inside your app to start finding hotspots, fixing issues, and optimizing performance. Once again, go to newrelic.com slash ATP to start monitoring your web, your web app's performance today and finding all your issues and fixing them all. Newrelic.com slash ATP. Thanks a lot. So one quick remaining thought on the Christie thing, which which I came up with, um, we said Christie had been there since the beginning. Let's suppose hypothetically that he was pretty well aligned or pretty chummy with Forstall. Then wouldn't it make sense for him to either choose to leave or be asked to leave? And and the the quiet rumblings I've heard are that that's exactly the case, that he was kind of in Forstall's camp. And 
maybe the person who's replacing him is someone who likes to argue a little bit more. And if that's the case, I'd consider that a wonderful thing. I, I think it's very smart of people who are in a position of power to have someone around them that argues because it forces you to really, really vehemently believe in your own opinion or change it, if the case may be. The best example of that from the you know, Steve Jobs' history is the, you know, him being adamant that iTunes, was it iTunes? Uh, was it the iPod shouldn't be available for Windows? iTunes Store shouldn't be available for Windows? Come on, you guys got to help me out here. It's not remembering. But anyway, yeah, iTunes for Windows, the chat room says, so I will trust them. But anyway, uh, whatever it was, it's something that eventually came to pass and was a, a enormously positive thing. And Steve Jobs was dead set against it. And it, it was just all of his most trusted lieutenants were constantly on him arguing, just like would not give it up. Like, we've got to do iTunes for Windows. He said, no, I'm never going to do it. I mean, eventually they wore him down. He's like, fine, do friggin' iTunes for Windows, whatever you want. Like, that sounds like an unhealthy dynamic, but I think that is that is actually a, a company. I mean, it's not it's not the healthiest it could be. It would be better if, uh, again, it was something more like the Pixar brain trust. Uh, but in, in some in many ways, it was similar because like with the, with the brain trust thing, it's... Uh, a bunch of senior people, uh, you know, I'll tell you what's wrong with your thing, but none of them have the power to tell you what you have to do. Like, they can't make you change your movie in the case of, of the brain. They just tell you, like, we think this is wrong, that's wrong, and maybe they suggest solutions, but they have no authority to make you do any particular changes. And in the case of Steve Jobs, his lieutenants didn't have the authority to make him put iTunes on Windows, but because he respected their opinions and because they were so insistent on it, eventually... You know, he went against his own better judgment and said, you know what, what am I even paying these people for if not to advise me? And they are so strong and unanimous in their, in their uh, you know, insistence that this is a good idea. He was kind of a baby about it and said, fine, whatever, put your stupid thing on Windows uh, if accounts are to be believed. Uh, and that definitely sounds like him. Uh, but in the end, he, you know, the system worked. Yeah, and that's exactly my point. And so, I mean, whether or not Christie was forced out, depending on who's replacing him, it could be a really wonderful thing. So we'll see. All right. So we have a few other things that we can talk about and something that, uh, that we've had on the show notes for a while that I don't think I completely understand yet. And I'd love to hear John, you explain it to me is what is this P cell thing all about? Oh, goody. Now I get to explain another thing that I don't know the details of, but I do think I know enough. <laughs> I do know enough, I think to, uh, to explain the, you know, the, the broad strokes and the broad strokes are actually interesting. Uh, so P, P cell is from uh, Steve Perlman is his name, I think. Uh, inventor, one, one of the original inventors of QuickTime. He also did the on live remote gaming service. And this is another one of his babies. And he has a little bit of reputation as kind of a genius crackpot, sort of like uh, Stephen Wolfram. Uh, undeniably incredibly smart and doing amazing things, but also prone to like presenting the, his uh, creations as the best things in sliced bread and kind of magic. Uh, and that's the difficulty with P-Cell is, uh, I forget what the original name for it was, but it's been rebranded to P-Cell. It's presented in a way that doesn't that doesn't explain how it works unless you already know how it works. And so it seems like magic. It's like you have all these problems with uh, cell phone reception because there's so many people with cell phones and there's so many towers and there's so much interference and there's weak signals and strong signals and you can't have the cell towers too close to like he's basically describing what we all know about current cell phone reception. He's like, well, what if that could all go away and you wouldn't have any problem and every single cell phone user would have the full bandwidth of the entire tower. And you're like, well, that's impossible. What are you talking about? And it sounds like a perpetual motion machine, and you tend to just dismiss him out of hand. Unless you already know what it is, in which case you would think, oh, well, I know what that is. And then it becomes boring. And those are the two extremes. Like, this sounds like magic. I, my, I'm going to be like the only person on Earth. It's like as if I have this whole cell tower to myself. Uh, and then you find out how it really works. If you happen to, and if you were in this field, it's not anything novel or, or amazing or new. There are, there are certain aspects of it that are that are uh, interesting from an engineering perspective. And then you're like, oh, it's that. Okay. Well, now, now I think I'm less excited about it. And that that was my experience as well. So, uh, here's what it is. Uh, what he was in the demonstrations, what he's talking about is having cell towers, and you can't put them too close together because they make interference with each other. And of course, every single cell phone that's trying to communicate with the cell tower, cell tower is interfering with the other cell phones that are communicating with the cell tower. And there's many different strategies that we use to allow multiple cell phones to talk to the tower. And you don't need to know the details of all of them, but like, you know, the most ancient one is like. Uh, you know, let's just all take turns. Uh, there's different ways of multiplexing our signals with, uh, 
you know, frequency division where we carve up it into different channels uh, on different frequencies or code division multiplexing where we send a signal that each thing can decode to figure out which part of the signal was relevant to it. Uh, but it all has to do with just a big shared space and all those techniques interference is bad because it screws up with the signal each thing is sending out and receiving. Um, what PCEL is trying to do is make it so that this, all the cell towers are aware of where all the cell phones are and they're aware of what signal is being put out by all the phones and all the other towers and they do a whole bunch of really complicated math to figure out, okay, we know what we want to send to everybody here we're going to output something such that our interference overlaps with each other in such a way that it sort of forms a hot spot right in the target area where all the combination of the interference from all the signals we're putting out sum up to exactly what we want to send to that phone. And then all the interference from all the signals we're putting out sum up to exactly the signal we want to put out to that other phone. And that's why it's like you get all you get all the bandwidth because it's a bunch of things working in concert to figure out exactly what they need to send out so that the sum of all their crazy interference exactly equals this, the exact clean signal they want to send to that particular phone. I'm massively simplifying it, obviously, but this is this is sort of the, the upshot of how it works. And the innovative thing they have is like, well, how do you do that? How can you have all these cell towers uh, figuring out exactly what they need to put out sort of in real time, you know, all the signals that are being sent and received to figure out what they have to put out to make the interference overlap to hit every single little cell phone. That sounds crazy. How could you do that? Well, that's part of the engineering breakthrough in that they claim to have a way to do that with like fiber optic cables or whatever running between the cell towers or slower links if you're willing to uh, allow for a little more slop in the system. And to be able to have a computing in each one of those locations that scales linearly, which is another topic on the topic list that we may get to someday, scaling, that scales linearly. So it's like, well, okay, so it's easy to do for two receivers, but is it 10 times as much to do four? It is like, what, how does it scale? It's like, well, we have a way, if you want to handle 50 people on a tower, then you need one computer. If you want to handle 100 people, you need two computers, you know, 200, you need four computers. You know, like, it scales linearly with the number of people. And that is an interesting engineering breakthrough, assuming it works as advertised. Uh, but there are limitations to the system. First of all, you do have to have all the towers talking to each other so they can figure out what the hell to output. Uh, you do need the fast connections between the towers. Uh, and if you make a slower connection between the towers, the, what you're giving up is essentially how fast the receivers can move. Uh, so, for example, if you were in a car and that car goes over something like 70 miles an hour, by the time all the cell towers figure out how to constructively overlay all their crazy overlapping signals to hit where, where you are, you've moved too far and it won't work as well. So there are speed limitations to this, which are not, you know, there are speed limitations that spe you moving around really quickly affects everything, but it affects this system more than others. So, it, you know, if you're in any sort of car trying to, you know, use your nav system or whatever and the system was in use, if you're going over 70, maybe it wouldn't be able to keep up with you if you only had microwave links between the, the, uh, the towers and everything. But the idea, and this, even I think Apple's, uh, routers and you know regular just wi-fi routers do this they call it beam forming or whatever the idea is an interesting one and it's it's great when an idea that was you know worked in labs for years and years suddenly becomes feasible in the real world due to you know engineering expertise which is essentially what they're trying to bring as a company to this uh and the theoretical benefits are there in that if you could get a system like this you can make a much more effective use of bandwidth and you can put cell you know small uh cell tower type emitters receivers everywhere um, and don't worry about how they overlap because it'll be just fine. That would, you know, that would make, that would make for uh, the ability to support more users in a congested, uh, you know, urban environment. Uh, and the other trick they have from engineering perspective is they didn't want to have to change all our phones. So they found a way using the existing features of like LTE, 4G that are in the existing protocol. So it's such that an unmodified plain old iPhone 5S or any other plain old cell phone can participate in this like they don't need to have a special chip in the phones or special computing in the phones or whatever and that again is another engineering type of breakthrough where yeah this was fine in theory but you can't just go replace all the cell phones in the world with these magic ones that work it's like well we found a way to get this to work using existing protocols with existing unmodified phones with all the smarts on the other end so i think it is is an interesting engineering uh, achievement assuming it works as advertised he still faces go-to-market challenges in terms of getting this technology into all the cell towers and who's going to be the first person to roll it out and how will it coexist with other things uh, but in the end it is not magic it's just science it's not particularly new science but the engineering uh, is where the interesting parts are there was a really neat video that i watched that um showed i believe it was a bunch of like laptops or tablets or whatever that were equipped with lte radios and they'd shown 
I'm going to probably get the details wrong, but they had shown what happens when you move around and they turned off the thing where it senses where you are. So basically, they concentrated this beam of LTE in a specific spot. And just for the purposes of the demonstration, rather than allow that beam to move around with the device, they kept it stationary. And you could see as they moved just a couple of inches that the throughput would just plummet. And then they would put the device back where it started and it would come back to like full HD video or something like that. And then when they had it working as it's designed, which is to say it will follow the device as it moves, you would get this full HD signal as the dude's like, you know, uh, just moving these devices around in the room with a reasonable quickness, not 70 miles an hour, but a reasonable quickness. And it was fascinating to watch and really, really impressive. In some ways, it's like engineering at its best because uh, what engineers do very well, uh, as opposed to, you know, scientists, uh, like, because they're, you know, th- th- two sides of the same coin, is the scientists will come up with something or these theories or whatever. But it's the, the job of the engineer is to be able to figure out, you know what, that theory was useless to us 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 50 years ago. But computing has advanced so much, or technology or material science or whatever has advanced so much that that crazy theory that no one ever pays attention to, you know, that, you know, it's like, well, that's not feasible. Obviously, you can never do that. Starts to enter the realm of feasibility. And engineers are rewarded by getting the jump at everyone and say, you know what? I think I can do that now. I think I can do that crazy beam forming thing, you know, across huge urban areas to people traveling up to 70 miles an hour with existing. I think I can do that now, like to get there first, right? Uh, because eventually when technology comes along and it's like, well, now we have, the, you know, everyone will realize we have the computing to do, you know, an algorithm that wasn't feasible before or a compression technique that, that used to be too computationally expensive, but now is trivial on, on phones, right? Like, and this is an example of that. Like, he seems to be out ahead of people in, in terms of, I think I can do that now. And here's my proof. And here's my implementation. Um, and whether or not it flies kind of like on live, like, I think I can make people have video games where the video gaming machine is in a data center, and they are miles and miles away. And I think gaming can work like that. Um, I, it did kind of work. I've, I have on live, I've launched it, I've played it, it's not great. But it, it's as a technology proof of concept, it's interesting. But there, you know, as with anything else, the engineering is only one small part of the battle of being successful in the market. But uh, as as non magical as it might be, uh, I do like what he does because kind of like Elon Musk, he's he's figuring out what is feasible with current technology and getting there just slightly ahead of, ahead of everyone else. And that's that's great engineering. Yeah, like I said, it, it was really impressive to me whether or not it's just the you know combination of a bunch of things we've known how to do for a while. It, it looked really cool. That's all Apple does too, right? Take take things, you know, we've had touch screens, we had capacitive touch screens. We've had, you know, user interfaces with buttons, like, you know, bring it all together, figure out that actually we can make a phone like that now and do it just a little bit ahead of everyone else. There's a big reward if you get all the parts right. Exactly. We are also sponsored this week by Igloo Software. Igloo is an internet you'll actually like. Now, most people think of intranets as, remember, this is not intranets, this is intranets, the old boring thing, right? The old, stale, terrible places that the corporate overlords make you go when you just want to use Dropbox or WordPress or something easy that helps you get your work done that actually works. Igloo brings the ease of use and familiarity from consumer software into your corporate environment by using familiar apps like shared calendars, Twitter-like microblogs, file sharing, and more. Every piece of content in your Igloo can be social, with comments and like buttons, and each team in your company can configure their own workspaces. So that's it for your users, but what if you're in charge of IT? Well, Igloo handles the security, hosting, and management for you. Igloo is SOC 2 Type 2 compliant, and they host data securely in SOC 2 Type 1 enterprise facilities in Canada, that's right, Canada, so everything is polite and CDRs cost too much, on their own servers. Igloo offers 256-bit SSL, and they are not vulnerable to Heartbleed. Uh, They offer backups, disaster recovery, single-tenant, and shared environments, integration with many authentication and sync systems, including SAML services and LDAP, and more. Igloo can even work with HIPAA-compliant organizations. You can also customize everything inside your Igloo with the ability to add CSS and JavaScript globally across one team space or even on a single page. You can see all this on the Igloo website, which is actually built on their platform. Learn more at igloosoftware.com slash Casey. Oh, right. igloosoftware.com slash Casey, where they made a funny landing page about why SharePoint sucks and how Igloo is better. 
Thanks a lot once again to Elu for sponsoring our show. I wanted to ask about scaling servers because we've had this on the sh- in the show notes for a while. Yeah, I love this. So on the topic list, there's just a simple bullet point that just says scaling servers. Like, you might as well have had a bullet point that said computers. <laughs> well, it, I, I wrote it there, and it was actually a reaction to a particular blog post that Brent Simmons put up uh, where he mentioned scaling and passing. And it's not, I don't want to get into a big thing about it, but it's just like, Every, every time I see this come up, and we, we do it ourselves, and people are sloppy with terminology, like, it's so important to keep reminding yourself, like, you know, the definition of terms, like, what what we should be talking about when we talk about scaling, because we use it as an umbrella term to talk about everything. And I kind of alluded to it in the PCL thing, but, like, my only point is, like, the old saw about the difference between performance and scaling. And so much of the time when I see people thinking they're blogging about scaling, all they're blogging about is performance, which is fine and interesting a topic of itself, but it's not the same thing as scaling. And so I just, you know, I put it in there as a reminder to myself to, to throw it out. So in brief, performance is how fast you can make something go. If you've got a computer and you've got a task to be done, I can do that task in five minutes. I need to increase my performance. Now I can do that task in three seconds. You've increased your performance. Scaling is I've got one task to do and I've got one computer. What if I give you 10 million of those tasks to do? Can you do them in the same time if you just use 10 million computers? That's scaling. It doesn't matter how long it takes. Even if it takes your computer a year to solve the problem, if I give you two of those problems, you can say, no problem, I'll just buy another computer. I can do both of them in a year. Okay, what if I give you three? I'll buy three computers. This is linear scaling. I'll buy three computers. I can do all three in a year. What if I give you three million? I'll buy three million computers. I can do all three million of those problems in a year. It's not about performance. Scaling and performance, although they often seem related, are not the same concept. And the failure to focus on scaling when you're talking about scaling and performance when you're talking about performance leads to all sorts of sadness. Oh, yeah. I mean, scaling is is not how fast your system is, but how easily you can make it take on more of something, usually more traffic, more users, more data, whatever the case may be. Um, how easy is it to take on more? And how many changes do you have to make to your software and to, to its architecture to to add that capacity because you know it's with almost everything it is not nearly as simple as oh just add more servers because you might have like all right well let's say you know you you can add more web servers pretty easily up to a point because web servers like you know you can distribute the calls to any of them with a load balancer as long as you don't use like weird shared sessions or anything you can distribute calls to any of them there you know any call coming in gets assigned to web server 67 and then Web Server 67 does whatever it needs to do and responds back. Okay, great. However, um, Web Server 67 probably has to access a database to do something. And how do you organize the databases? And that's usually, it's the data layer, not the web serving application layer, that's usually the hardest to scale. Um, because that's when you have things like uh, globally shared storage. You have things like uh, limits on disk performance and on on how many how many writes can a single server even write per second? Uh, if you're you know if you if you've scaled away all the reads and and given reads to all these like you know replicating servers, how, you know that's fine. But can they even keep up with the writes? How many writes does the master do? And then if you split the role up like that, then you get into 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 really hard issues. Like all right, well, how do you cache data? Can you be sure that the data that you have read off of the read slave is up to date? Otherwise, you can't really cache it because you might be clobbering something in the cache that is newer, uh, or you might be caching old data when new data is available. And there's all these like really hard problems that go along with it that makes scaling such a complex, interesting topic, and and uh, and why why it's such a hard problem. And that's why when I see a blog post about like how to make a, a data structure smaller or a query more efficient, and then the word scaling used in that same conversation, it's like that's, that's performance. You're just talking about performance, like you know. And you talk about the web tier, like since that you know, oh, it's stateless. We can scale that out horizontally forever. Like nothing scale. Even the web tier, even the web tier is not like that one to one scaling that I was using in my example. If you ever get there you have reached the golden, you know, that you, you will be a bazillionaire. Because even just getting there, even on the web tier, it's like, well, but what about different data centers? Now we need a geographical load balancing. And what about network connections? Like, even nothing, nothing scales perfectly. But you're right, like, you know, the first thing you, you, you run into it is with state. And you get into the cap theorem of, you know, uh, consistency, uh, partition tolerance, and uh, availability. Like, this is well-trod territory. Lots of people will concentrate in scaling. Google knows probably the most about it of any company in the entire world, given the scale they operate at. Microsoft seems to be learning a lot about it. Apple, not sure what they know. But like, 
scaling is super <laughs> hard. Performance performance is super hard. Uh, and I I mean, from the outside, it, this is all like sort of esoteric stuff. But even for people who are just working on a small system, uh, and it's like it doesn't matter. You're not going to have you're not going to have Facebook level users, right? Uh, but even on a very small system, ten users, a hundred users, a thousand, two hundred thousand, even then you should be thinking about both performance and scaling and keeping a clear head about which one you're concentrating on and don't concentrate too much on scaling and not enough on performance or too much on performance and not enough scaling. Just keeping a clear head about what the individual tasks are. Um, and you will eventually find yourself, even in a small system, reading all those papers about the theory behind it and making your trade-offs about, you know, uh, you know, the consistency, availability, and partition tolerance. Like you, you have to make decisions about. It. If you don't make decisions, the software you choose will make the decisions for you, and you'll be sad about it. So, like, that's all part of the learning process. But uh, it, it's, I don't know. I, I it, it's. I don't want to pick on any particular blog posts. I love reading those Brent posts. I love watching him think out loud about what he's doing, and he's a great example of a great software developer. Like, sort of, you know, showing his showing his work as he works towards a product and everything like that. It's just that. uh I have since I've dealt with server side software my entire career I have a particular itch when I see the word scaling and it's not really talking about scaling and maybe I'm just being a pedant right Casey <laughs> That's right that's right Well and there is there is something to be said um for performance optimization to a point you know it's it's very similar to the premature optimization wisdom in the world except and Brent even addressed this in in one of his posts on uh, inessential.com which we should mention um he, he even addressed, like, you know, when you're talking about server-side design, like, for client-side stuff, premature optimization is is considered a bad thing because we have such fast hardware. We have so much memory these days on client-side devices and desktops and everything. We have so much. We have so many resources that it's just, it's just not really worth doing super micro-optimizations everywhere. Um, however, on servers, things are a little bit different. On servers you are paying for what you use basically and if your app gets popular at all e- even for a for a minimal amount of uh of of users relatively speaking to like something like facebook like you know if you get 100,000 users using a web service um that's going to that's substantial needs for for that hardware and depending on what your service is doing that actually could need some serious resources and so that could you know you could be call, you you could be talking the difference between hundreds of do- hundreds of dollars a month or thousands of dollars a month worth of hardware or even more than that and and so you know it can really make or break your whole economics it can it can make you busier or not as busy like one of the best things to happen for for servers and scaling in the last decade has been SSDs because for a long time for a lot of lamp type a- applications uh, one of the biggest limitations was the database's disk speed and like like a tumblr i was able to replace i think it was about nine or 12 read slave servers with one with ssds and you know nine or 12 servers that had 15k sas disks in raid 10 being replaced with one ssd based server and the and those were those were old intel x25 uh e ssds like you know they've come a long way since then that you know that now modern SSDs are even faster than those, and you know it's like when when you can make a big you know order of magnitude type jump if you can go from from ten database servers to one database server you know that kind of difference actually matters and is worth doing you know that that is something where performance has a direct impact a direct measurable feelable impact on scaling optimization for performance to a point actually is useful because in practice in practice most people most most people who make these web services and make apps and stuff like that most people are not going to get as big as facebook and google most people are not even going to get as big as you know smaller things that we've all heard of you know it's most people are lucky to get a hundred thousand users to their web service you know and and so by making decisions uh that that favor high performance you can often keep you know that could often be the difference between being able to run everything off of a cheap, easy to, easy to administer VPS or a, a fully managed cloud service at a reasonable price, and running a whole bunch of dedicated servers, or running or paying tons of money for for a cloud service or one of these things, like that could make that big of a difference. And so it is 
or you know, or on the scaling side, this could be the difference between you know needing just one fast database server and needing a multi-server setup, or being able to fit all on one server, or or having to shard the database, which is really complicated and adds a lot of maintenance, or having to use a different type of tool entirely, like Cassandra, which is a world of hurt. It's just so incredibly not worth using, uh, and and so you know, performance does matter to the point where having a high performance system has a very good chance of keeping you from ever needing a difficult to scale system. Well, but businesses, if they're successful, well, the actual business, the people who don't understand, you know, the business people who don't understand technology and don't want to will apply both of these pressures to you because they will apply pressure for you to increase performance because they don't want to pay a lot of money for servers, right? But they will also apply the pressure of you for scaling because they will say, my business plan says we're going to grow 50% year over year for the next five years. So you need to be able to say, okay, we have five customers now. In in five years, we're going to have 5 million customers. Uh, so I, you know, whatever multiple that is, I don't want to pay if we if you have greater than linear scaling. It's like okay, well, one customer costs us ten bucks, but two customers cost us a hundred dollars. You've got a scaling problem immediately because they want the business to grow, but they they want it to grow less than linear. They don't want they want to be able to double their number of customers, but not double their hardware costs. And what you're telling them is, well, that's not how scaling works. If we double our customers, I need to way more than double our hardware costs. And it's like, how much more? How close are you to perfect linear scaling? Uh, and so they, they want both. They want it, you know, it's too expensive. Every time we get another client, we need to buy X amount of hardware and it costs so much money. And we're making only a certain amount of money from each individual client we add. We can't afford to add that much hardware, so increase your performance. But year over year over year, they're like, look, we're going to quadruple our customer base. Can you quadruple our customer base? And you're like, oh, we can't. We got one database server. We're, we're already buying the biggest machine that we could possibly, that money can buy for our database server. We need a strategy for scaling, you know, and then you end up sharding. And, you know, what about people in different parts of the country? Then, you, well, if, the, if they're in shards, how do these people interact with each other? And it, like, it's in some ways, it's easier for software where it doesn't matter, like Facebook, where you're like, the message shows up here a little bit sooner than it shows up there. It's not, it's not a banking system or whatever. Uh, but not everyone's that lucky. Sometimes it really has to be, you know, that's where you get into the cap theorem again, where you have to pick your trade-offs. Um, and, and it's difficult. And even no matter how bounded your problem is, uh, even, you know, it just all does is scale everything down. If you're like, oh, I want to stick to, to, you know, VPSs or something really cheap. I don't want to buy dedicated. Like you're playing in the small leagues, but it still matters for your company. Because when you're going from 10 customers to 10,000, it's it's the same exact thing playing out. It's just a smaller scale versus companies that start off from day one buying massive dedicated hardware. And the only difference in the, in the high end uh, game is that the high end people are more likely to get into the situation where they are buying the most expensive computer equipment that money can buy from anyone on the entire planet. When they get to the end of their scaling rope and they're like, well, uh, like. We've increased performance as much as we can go. We have, if, no matter how much money we wave at somebody, we cannot get a bigger single machine to do task X. It's like now, if you waited this long to think about scaling, you have a serious problem because you've you've hit the performance dead end. Like I guess you could optimize your software, but like, yeah, it's it's the same. It's the same story. It's just you know, it's it's a fractal of itself. It just just depends on how many uh, commas there are before the decimal point in the in the, uh, <laughs> the invoices. <laughs> right, and and that's this is one of the reasons why. I really prefer to do things at at a relatively low level and to do things that are fairly standard because you know even if you don't need scaling you know in quotes even even if you don't think you need that today um like knowing how to scale something or knowing knowing the steps that you take and and the hurdles you will face is useful when writing anything even before it needs to be scaled so for instance um I I've said on a number to a number of occasions I never write database joins ever. Um, joins are joins basically put a lot of work on the database server, which granted it is very optimized to do. However, uh, I prefer to split up the joins into two calls, like one to fetch the list of IDs and the second to fetch from the target table, you know which ones you get and you know stuff like that, and design the schema and the code to do that. Um, and that's for two major reasons. One is to make the to give the database a little bit less work, um, well, three major reasons. One, give the database less work because database CPU power, database resources are expensive and hard to scale. Uh, the second one is caching. So maybe you can cache that first query. You know, the, maybe you can cache the list of IDs you need, and then you know only fetch the records, or vice versa, only fetch the IDs and then fetch the records from cache. Things like that. And then the third is that then that also gives me the ability later on 
if the service gets really big to say, you know what, the user's table now has to have its own database. This this gets hit so often, and it's su- it's such a drain of performance that we, we should split this up into its own database cluster entirely. Uh, so users is now on a different database. Then you can't do a join because it's not even on the same server anymore. Uh, so even like even with Overcast, I'm not running any joins. I'm doing it the same way I've always done it because it's not that much harder, and it's you know just in case in the future that'll be fine. I'll be set up for that. I'll be ready to go. Um, so you know there's so many other things like I'm very careful use of indexing. Um, one of the most useful books I ever read uh, on scaling was uh, High Performance MySQL. And I read I read the edition before the current one, and I liked it a lot. The current one got a lot longer, and the reviews weren't as good. So I'm not sure if the current one is great. I didn't actually read the whole thing. But the uh, previous one was awesome, so maybe give it a shot. Uh, but you know, I think it's important, it's important to make those decisions. Like if you're writing, s- suppose you're writing C code for an app, and you're calling something like Sterlin, in in the loop to say like oh you know iterate through the string and calling sterlin you know i is less than sterlin string if you know about performance at all you're going to look at that and say wait a minute i'm you know that's being invoked on every single call you you get this mentality that makes you make small decisions like that better and in the course of a whole project that adds up and at the end even though any one of those calls probably won't matter when you make every decision with a certain mindset and a certain sensibility and a certain wisdom about what will happen in the future uh, or, or what the cost of this will, might be or might add up to, when you make all those small decisions the right way, the sum of all of that is different and does matter. Same thing applies to scaling. When you make a bunch of small decisions to say, oh, you know what, I can put a little more work on, this, on the database here or, you know, this doesn't need to be that optimized. Even, you know, the index isn't quite right to do this index only or... Or, uh, you know, this is going to have to scan a bunch of rows to get these results, but that'll be all right. You know, it's how often do you really really have to do that? Once you get into the mindset of thinking, okay, what's going to happen when I have to do this thousands of times a second? You'll probably never have to. But if you think about that from the beginning, you can make better small decisions along the way that will add up and that will make scaling easier for you. Can we go back a step? You're saying that you'd rather make round trips to the database than do something that the database is specifically designed to do. That I mean, I think what he's saying is that he doesn't want to use a database, right? I, I, mean, <laughs> I know you don't like the the newfangled key value storage things or whatever, but uh, if if you're not going to do joins, and I, I'm not saying that's the right or wrong decision, but if that's the the route you're going, there are probably places you could store your data uh, that would give you better performance for this same kind of usage pattern. I imagine the reason you wouldn't like them is because uh, they're newer and less mature and don't, you know, you, you're used to the features of being able to, you know, back up MySQL and do easy replication. And those are all important features and the reason to stick with it. But you're kind of using MySQL in sort of a degenerate state. Like you're using it as a, <laughs> re- a really bad performing poor man's key value storage with some basic filtering, doing your own joins client side, which is fine because you get the other benefits of it, your familiarity, easy backup, easy replication, reliability. And, you know, that's why you're avoiding, you know, that's why you're not another MongoDB, uh, you know, nightmare story. Yeah, I, I think, you know, obviously I know as as you and as the chat have said, I'm going to get a lot of email about my, my no joins stance. Um, but the fact is, first of all, you just said MySQL is way slower. Uh, than some other system. And that's probably not the case. Certainly, it is not always the case. Um, the reason I use MySQL, even though I'm not using some of the you know, relational database type features like joins, um, I, also, you know, I don't use store procedures either. That's another thing where you know, that's just asking for trouble. I don't use triggers, things like that. Um, you know, the reason I do this is because MySQL is just freaking awesome. It, it, there's no other way to say it. I've I've heard so much crap about MySQL from people who who don't use it and, and are prejudiced against it or whatever. And I know, you know, I don't use Postgres. I don't use Oracle. I've, I don't have any experience with those, so I can't tell you how it compares to those. But I can tell you most of the criticism I've heard about MySQL is wrong uh, or at best outdated and only applied to my ISAM and not the more recent InnoDB um, storage engine, which at this point is not even recent. Um, and so if you use MySQL with InnoDB as your storage engine for all tables... It's amazing. It is awesome. There, it's, and and I, I said this in a post recently, and I, I, you know, the gravity of this, I don't want to overstate this, but it's, it's, it's hard to overstate this. 
in all the time of Tumblr, Instapaper, all that time, now Overcast, I have used MySQL a lot. And, you know, with Tumblr, it was under extreme stress for, for the entire time I was working there. It was constantly under extreme stress. I have never seen MySQL crash once. I have never seen MySQL corrupt data once. That's amazing. Look at any... Oh, oh you sh- you've never seen it corrupt data. I, you know, like, I have never seen it corrupt data. I've never seen it crash. That's MySQL's actual functionality could be argued to be a, a corruption of data. I know it's documented. I know, <laughs> you up, it's, I know if you look it up in the docs, it says that's exactly what it's going to do. It's not, it's not wrong. It's not a bug. But like that's, that's the philosophical difference that many like, quote-unquote real database people have with MySQL's like, the documented behavior. When it performs that documented behavior, database people grit their teeth and get angry at it and i'm kind of one of them <laughs> I, I haven't i'm not that familiar with exactly what you're talking about however if you like are, are you sure you're talking about nodb and you know modern versions of this like we like, like no no like weird weird coercions of data types and cases where columns that are marked as not null can actually have nulls and weird things with empty strings and like they're all documented you go to those mysql gotcha pages and just read through them and uh, you know in, in terms of performance though like now that i'm saying you should switch to a different thing or something but like because most of the things that have massively better performance have much, much less of the other things you just described, like stability and reliability. But performance-wise, if your data model is kind of uh, simple and never going to have joins, and if you care about getting more performance, which you may or may not, there are lots of other database systems that do go way faster uh, than, than MySQL, especially within ODB. <laughs> because like it's you know, the, the extra overhead of that of that storage engine you know, the, the, most of the, the new hotness is basically people do almost everything in memory. Like it's, you know, there's, it's not, it's not like memcache, although there is like a persistent memcache thing, but a lot of them are like, look, we can't involve disk in the operation of our thing here. And as you can imagine, when you do almost everything in memory, you go way faster than MySQL trying to do stuff with NODB. Oh, sure. Well, and, you know, and there's ways you can, you, you know, you can take advantage of that with caching already. You can do, th- and by the way, MySQL does already cache a lot in memory, but, you know, certain, and of course the OS will cache a lot of the disk blocks in memory and stuff like that. But, um, you know, certainly you can use MySQL with Redis or Memcache or any of the, any of the cache systems that are out there. And, and it's fine. I mean, most people do, it's fine. Um, you know, that's like people, there, there's this big, it's the cool thing to use a different storage engine these days. But the fact is a storage engine is, oh boy, here we go. A storage engine is like a file system. Uh, in you, know, you don't want to change that very often and you want it to be extremely conservative and extremely focused on data integrity. And MySQL is so incredibly like battle-tested. It is so solid. And yeah, I get that it might not have always been that way back in the olden days with MySAM and all the crap, but those days are well into the past now. And modern MySQL, MySQL has been rock solid, I would say, for at least seven or eight years. And that's why Google use it very heavily. I don't know if they still do, but they at least did. Um, I know lots of major, major sites use MySQL. Twitter use it for a long time. They probably still do. Uh, there, there's a reason why. It's really, really good. And it's people, there was this great blog post a few years back when uh, friend feed existed. Uh, so to give you some idea. And it was a blog post called How FriendFeed Uses MySQL to Store Schemaless Data. And I'll have to find it and put it in the show notes. But there, there's a lot of good stuff in here. FriendFeed was a weird project that was run by incredibly good engineers. And it's it, it basically addresses a lot of this stuff. Like MySQL, even if you don't use some of the database features of it, MySQL is still an amazingly fast, solid, low needs, low maintenance storage engine that has tons of tools, a huge ecosystem, tons of optimization potential. Uh, there's so many reasons to use it, and if you look at one of the newer systems, it's you know, and you know things like Mongo or you know the, all these like new NoSQL type systems. If you look at a lot of those, yeah, they have some benefits, but if you don't necessarily need those benefits. And what you really want is for your database to be like a file system and to be basically bulletproof. MySQL is a great choice. And I feel like it gets ignored because it's old. This comparison is kind of harsh. So I don't mean that the way it's going to sound, but uh, it's as it's, it's close as we can align them if we're to align these two things. <laughs> Here we go. Uh, in, in the world of databases, what is the PHP of databases? It's kind of MySQL. It's way better than PHP, don't get me wrong. But if you have to map one to it, like that's what ends up. And like, what's the Python of databases? That's probably Postgres. 
uh, you know, like that, that's that's more or less how things line up. And like, what's the what's the C C plus plus of databases? That's like Oracle, you know. And what's the Ruby? It's like you know Volt DB or something. Like, but to align things, I say it very clearly PHP. MySQL is the PHP of databases, and that sounds terrible. I know because it is not as bad as PHP. Do not get me wrong. PHP is terrible, but like <laughs> it, it has many of the same characteristics and like. That it's everywhere, it's a known quantity, it's reliable, it has idiosyncrasies, but once you know what those idiosyncrasies are, they don't bother you that much. And the thing about using it for schema lists, like, that's why people do that. Like, because they're like, okay, I have a tool that I know is reliable, I know what it's capable of, and I'm going to use it, like I said, in a degenerate kind of way. Like, I'm actually going to use it for schema list data. I know it's not a schema list database system. I know there actually are schemas, but I'm going to define some table with columns for key and value and version number and some other crap, and, um, and it'll work. And it's like, you were taking advantage of a system that works in a, in a way that you're comfortable with that has all the features you need and is reliable and you're building something else on top of that uh, and all i was saying with the other database type things is like if you care more about performance there is these days much more performance to be had if you're willing to trade it for less reliability and more unknowns you know and i'm hoping that that sort of younger section of the of the data storage world matures and coalesces and we get some sort of equivalent of, of mysql or even best case some equivalent of postgres where it's like a tried and true known quantity within that realm right now we don't have it now right now it's kind of the cambrian explosion over there and we're not sure how it's going to shake out but uh um, it's still it's still worth keeping your eye on because if you know 20 years from now you're still using uh, uh my sequel with no joins it will be a, either a great failure of the no sequel world to come up with a useful product for the long term or a great failure of you to keep an eye on uh what's going on <laughs> over there uh, possibly both i have two questions firstly what is the pearl of databases john yeah, I was trying to think of that. I don't know. Um, <laughs> maybe maybe MSQL, but neither one of you remember that. <laughs> no, there is really is no purpose. There's no if there is, I don't know what it is. It's probably one of the uh, one of the newfangled database systems that I'm just not familiar enough with. Because there's nothing that has the kind of like there's nothing that has the same combination of like a precursor to all of the better known ones now, but with lots of weird quirks. Like I don't I don't know what that is, but you know, it's it's not MySQL, definitely. Isn't it just some academic paper that swears that it's academically flawless? No, that, that, that's Perl. That's Perl six. You're thinking of. <laughs> Is there a database that can be written but not read? PHP looks just like Perl. You can't even make that comment. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's not go down that road. Can we still back up to you? Just spent Marco five or ten minutes explaining how of how MySQL is amazing and reliable and does what it's supposed to do really well, but you don't trust it to do a freaking join? Like, the, I, I can't get past that. No, no, it isn't an issue of trust. It's an issue of leaving yourself open for future scaling options. It's about being able to say, you know what, my database server is going to, at some point, be split off from my web server once, I, once my, have, my service has more than five users, and this is going to have its own server, and it's going to be harder and more expensive to increase database hardware resources than to increase application or web hardware resources. And so you might as well have the application and web stuff do more of the work and make the database, uh, give the database an easier job. So things like, you know, reduce the number of queries to it, but the number of queries that go to it, that, you know, make them access fewer rows, make them access fewer tables, make it have to do less CPU work, but it, it's more about IO. Um, you know, let the database do only what the database is required to do and let your other servers take on as much work as they can. Okay, but you'd rather ping away at it and do a gazillion round trips to avoid these joins? Like, I, and I, I, get, I, I haven't been through a Tumblr. I haven't been through an Instapaper. So I'm doing that thing, which I told you I don't want to do in the beginning of the episode where I'm saying that seems weird. But, but genuine question, have you ever done anything to empirically prove to yourself like have you used a new relic to prove to yourself that this is legitimately the right way to go uh, it, like it, you, you can do it on paper i think you could convince yourself but uh, i'm sure i'm not gonna answer for marco but i'm sure the answer to that is yes because anyone who works in service i'd offer quickly realizes oh the part that has all the state is the hardest part to scale i mean he basically just laid it out like you can just do it on paper there's a certain amount of work that needs to be done. One part of your system you can scale really really easily one part is really hard to scale you want the hard to scale part to do like the same, uh, whatever operation it does the most efficiently, primary key lookups maybe, have it do that same operation over and over and over again and have everything else you can do put on the easier to scale parts. Like, you know, there's lots of ways you can do this with math to figure out, uh, you know, how it works. But like just, I, I think you, even if you just think about that logically and reason through it, 
and and that's not even going to get you linear scaling. Like we're just trying to like keep our heads above water with this type of strategy. You you always want to push the the work out to the system that's easiest to scale. And so, I mean, it's kind of the Google approach of like with Bigtable, where they went to the extreme, where like their their data store was like really annoying to deal with and unreliable, and applications had to retry and figure out how to resolve conflicts, and it was just like it made it incredibly hard to write applications. But like that was the price of scaling early on, and they've made strides in that way. But basically, you're trying to move the work to the systems that are easy to scale, and web servers are way easier to scale, and not not performance scale. And and again, you're confusing performance, and like, oh, we got to take those round trips, you're going across the network, you're making multiple queries. It's like, that's performance. We're talking about scaling. Yeah, that's a fair point. And I uh, I did that deliberately. For whatever it's worth, you know, we're putting a lot of, you're putting a lot of uh, weight on these round trips. Round trips to a database server or to a memcache server that's, you know, in the same rack or at least in the same data center as, as the server <laughs> that you're coming from. That's um, a good point. You know, it, we're not talking about a lot of time here. I don't think, you know, and it, a lot of this depends on the kind of application you're writing. How much data are you actually querying? Like, to build the page, you know, or to build the API response that you're talking about, how many database calls do you actually have to do? Is it seven or eight? Is it 50? Like, is it more? Like, there's, the what you're doing matters a lot. And, you know, it, it, Instapaper was fairly easy to scale um, because it just it was never as big as Tumblr. And I was using I was using Tumblr style techniques at Instapaper, so of course it was way overkill, uh, which was great, which is why which is why I was able to afford to run it uh, and and not go crazy and not go broke. But uh, you know, at Tumblr we face things like to give you one example: um, how do you display the list of posts on somebody's dashboard? So you have to figure out right, who they follow, and then of everyone they follow, t- find enough posts from those people to make 20 of them and order them properly. There are so many different ways to do that. And there are, there are the naive ways, where you do a few joins, and then you, have, and then you do a big sort, and it's all fine. But you know, the naive way does not really scale very well, just because you start dealing with hundreds of gigs of data pretty quickly, and... The, and the database having to scan, you know, millions of rows, and and that starts performing very badly. So, a lot of times, what you think is the most like good naive approach, actually in practice, um, does not it, it is not useful. It is not it does not scale well enough. You know, it becomes too expensive or becomes um, completely impractical or impossible to do at scale. Um, so you start having to do weird little hacks and. So, you know, one of the hacks that we did at Tumblr early on was uh, actually some, something that I learned from Wikipedia, what they did on their schema back, and this was probably 2007 or 2008, uh, which is you actually have basically a separate table that acts as an index because in certain ways it uses memory more efficiently to do that or in certain ways the query optimizer will use that better. And so, like, you'll ha- we had, like, a posts reference table that was basically the... It was it was a cert, it was a special index of the posts table, and the post table was this massive thing that was hundreds of gigs that would only ever be accessed by primary key because, as John said, primary key access are very fast and everything's optimized for that. They cache very well, everything else. So you get the list of post IDs from other calls, and then you could fetch cache posts or fetch posts from the, from the database, or even get them from slaves, and it was mostly all right. So there's all sorts of things you can do if you leave yourself options. That's what I'm saying. So. And, and, you know, look, I would love, again, this is like the idea, <laughs> this is almost the final discussion. Academically, I, I would love to say, yeah, you know, just use the database as intended and it works great and that's the easiest and fastest. In practice, it's not. In practice, things are more complicated and you can do the nice simple way for a while, but eventually you're going to hit a wall. And what options you have when you hit that wall depends on how you've built the system. And how much effort it is to get over that wall and how much it will cost you in both things like hardware or service costs and in, in, in administration time and maintenance over time. Uh, that will all depend on how you've built that system. And if you've built it to give yourself good scaling options in mind and to, and to, to do things like be gentle on, on your databases, um, you will have more options and it will be cheaper and easier to scale. Here's an uh, analogy that I think Casey will be able to identify with. It's like, you know, when you have like, well, maybe in C++ at least, when you have code and you want to make it faster, very often that involves making it longer and uglier. 
this is the same type of thing. You're like, how could it be faster? I'm adding more and more lines of code, like whether you're unrolling a loop or doing some setting up some big bunch of setup stuff to do a bunch of, you know, SIMD operations on it. Like it gets longer and it gets uglier. It looks like you're doing more. It's like this seems like it's more work. Uh, you know, in the same way, you're like, well, I had this nice query that got me all the data I wanted in one big self-consistent blob with this nice join query, and I'm replacing it with these multiple queries when I just I mesh the data together myself. Like that's it's longer. How could that be better? I mean, I guess it's not completely accurate in the C C plus plus case. Like you're actually increasing performance, and here, like Marco said, you're you're protecting yourself for future scaling. Although in some cases, in even in the deep dark world of databases, you mentioned stored procedures before. If your query planner is not your friend, like say if you use Informix, speaking from experience, uh, sometimes if you want to get a massive amount of data, it's better to write a stored procedure procedure and essentially be the query planner yourself. Do it all in the database, you know, all right on top of the thing, but say, look, when I give you this join, you're going to do something dumb. So let me run this query, this query, this query, join the mesh the results together, put them in a temp table, index the temp table, join against that temp table with the second thing. Like, and you, you're like, how could that possibly be faster than just running the query you wanted? It's like, well, the query planner made some very unfortunate life choices when we sent it this query. <laughs> and as a matter of fact, doing this crazy stored procedure, like, I mean, once you're creating temp tables and indexing them, you're like, there's no way that could be faster than running that query. You're like, well, you know, let me show you. Like, it, databases are funny things. And the more you can treat them the way Marco's treating treating them, the less headaches you'll have about them. And I think the more you should think about whether you should even be using a database. But that's you know that's a conversation another time. But anyway, the the idea that the sort of client side code or the consuming code gets longer and uglier and more complicated that is not outside the the realm of normal programmer experience when just increasing the performance of your regular you know compiled code. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, and and it's a balance. You know, it's a balance you have to strike. Obviously, you know, if you're hitting severe problems and severe scaling challenges, you're going to have to go more in that direction of more complex code that you, and and that'll be more bugs. You'll have things like weird caching bugs and, you know, things like replication delay or eventual consistency bugs uh, depending on depending on what your what kind of structure you're using. And that's all hard. That's all complicated and Certainly, you shouldn't do that sooner than you have to in most cases. But it again, it's a balance. Just like you shouldn't waste all your memory as much as possible when you're writing a C program um, or any program for that matter. You know, it's it's you got to find the balance. And with servers and scaling, I would lean a little more just because of the nature of you know using someone else's vast resources on their computer versus expensive shared server resources. I would lean a little bit more towards a little more complicated but way more scalable. That makes sense. And far be it for me to argue with you, Mr. Tumblr. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Taking that on a business card? All right. Thanks a lot for our three <laughs> sponsors this week. PDF Pen for iPad, New Relic, and Igloo. And we will see you next week. Now the show is over. They didn't even mean to begin. Because it was accidental. Oh, it was accidental. John didn't do any research. Marco and Casey wouldn't let him. Because it was accidental. Oh, it was accidental. And you can find the show notes at atp.fm. And if you're into Twitter, you can follow them at C-A-S-E-Y-L. ISS, so that's Casey Liss, M A R C O A R M E N T Marco Armen, S I R A C U S A Syracuse. It's accidental. They didn't mean to. Accidental. Tech podcast so long. I'd like to tell you about why I hate my car now. Wow. Is it because, is it, did it get dirty finally? <laughs> no, it, it is actually relatively dirty, dirty at the moment. Um, Aaron and I decided this past Saturday to go to the local drive-in movie theater. And if you have a local drive-in movie theater, I cannot suggest enough that, assuming you don't have small children, which I guess definitely eliminates Marco and probably eliminates John in this particular context. Um, if you don't have small kids, you can escape the kids. Go to a drive-in movie. It's really cool. And so the way uh, the Goochland Drive-In Theater works, which is between uh, Charlottesville and Richmond, is you pull in, you pay something like $8 a person in your car, and you get a double feature. 
and you get the audio for the double feature by tuning to a FM station that the that the theater broadcasts. And it's a really cool experience, especially on a really pretty night like this past Saturday was. And we have been several times in the past, although not for a year or two. And when we've gone in the past, we've taken my car, which at the time was my uh, Subaru. Uh, what color was that? That was white. We've oh. taken Aaron's car, which was and is still a Mazda 6, which is a grayish silver. And we've never had an issue. Well, this past Saturday, I had just washed and waxed and leather conditioned and vacuumed Aaron's car. And so I thought, well, my car's dirty because, yes, my car does get dirty. It just takes longer than 40 nanoseconds, um, unlike Marco's car. So we decided to take the BMW. The BMW has a push-button starter, and it has an accessory mode. And so I figured, self, there will be no issue here. What we'll do is we will go to the drive-in theater. I will put the car in accessory mode by turning it off and then pressing the push button once. And we will listen to the movie on the stereo, and it will be wonderful. I will turn off the iDrive display. I had to figure out how to do that because I completely forgot. And I will turn off the iDrive display, and everything should be good and right in the world. So that's what we did. And after 10 minutes, I heard the BMW chime that you might remember from Neutral. And it was telling me that my battery was dying. What? After 10 minutes of having the radio on. Doesn't your car have two batteries? Or is that just Marco's car? I don't think Marco's car does, does it? Uh, not that I know of. Marco's car has like 10 batteries, right? I thought it only had one. You couldn't you couldn't find the one battery that one time, so we don't know how many <laughs> batteries are in this car. Who, this car could be filled with batteries. I thought they're always on the passenger side in the uh, trunk. No, we, we went through this. Anyway, I thought his car had two batteries, and I thought I thought that was a common BMW thing, but what do I know? I buy Hondas. <laughs> it may be for all I know. But anyway, now... I, it could be that I that the battery in my car is original. I believe it is. And it was purchased originally in, I think, December of 2010. So it, we're getting to the point that maybe this is all a battery issue that I'm misconstruing to be a car issue. But what I can tell you is that the radio at least once turned itself off because it felt like it was tired of being on and it had thought that I'd left it on not deliberately. And unlike in a keyed car where you physically put the key into accessory mode in a push button car, it's just being told, well, yeah, go put yourself an accessory. And I guess we'll hope that you don't turn yourself off and it turned itself off. And then I turned it back on. And like I said, after like another 10 minutes or something like that, it started dinging away about how the battery was dying. So we ended up watching only the first of the double feature by lowering the windows, which by the way, used a whole lot of juice because because, uh, you know, moving a motor is a heck of a lot harder than move, than having an FM radio on. But I did that. We lowered the windows and we listened through everyone else's <laughs> FM radios because my damn car wouldn't stay running. And I was afraid I wouldn't be able to crank it. And the other really th interesting thing is even though they have little jump starting boxes at the theater, I was so scared that it would get so dead and the jump starting boxes would take so long to trickle charge it that I wouldn't even be able to push start the car because it wouldn't be able to engage the push button ignition into run mode to get the thing so I could freaking push start it. So it sort of ruined our entire movie going experience. And granted, we're talking about a sum total of $16, but it was really, really, really annoying. So now if we take my car to the movie theater again, if for no other reason than the auto disable, we're going to have to take a freaking stereo for like a boom box with us and keep it quiet so we can listen to the stupid movie. Yeah, it's a good thing you you already got her to marry you because you were not impressing <laughs> your date on this night. <laughs> <laughs> it's so true. Okay, two things. One... The fact that you can solve this problem by getting like a twenty dollar boombox makes it a lot less of a problem. True. Uh, two. Do you think anybody who designed this whole like you know electronic push button start and accessory mode and automatic turn off? Do you think any of those people involved in those decisions have ever been to a drive-in movie theater? Oh, certainly not. But it's still very annoying. You know, some of the recent iPods had FN tuners in them. Like the old iPod Nanos, you have any of those hanging around? Did they have FN tuners? Oh, yeah, we could do that with the yeah. headphone splitter, actually. <laughs> that would be totally ridiculous. But it could work. Uh, and also, you should just get a new battery for your car, because that's ridiculous. And yes, batteries do go bad sometimes suddenly after many years, so you do have to replace them. 
Yeah, and actually, the more I think about it, the more I think that may be the issue in terms of the warning about, uh, oh God, there's actually, there's something that pops up on the iDrive. It's uh, increased battery discharge because it gets very upset that, that the battery got as low as it did. And so the next time I take the car in, which will probably be for the N55 recall that everyone just, real or that BMW just announced, I will certainly ask them to either replace it or double, triple check that it is as healthy as they claim it is. But man, what a stupid problem to have. I mean, I, maybe this is the biggest first world problem ever. It probably is. But what a frustrating, silly problem to have. Because in Aaron's car, which has a key, like most normal cars, none of this would have been an issue. And I also wonder if part of the problem was because the iDrive is a whole freaking computer, I, I wonder if the whole damn computer was turned on with a little 12 or 15 gig uh, hard drive spinning and so on and so forth, even though the display was off. In other words, there's not like a short circuit, if you will, just for the FM radio to keep that on. And the whole freaking nav and everything was powered on just so I could listen to the radio. Do you think you could have brought the soundtrack to the movie on vinyl and maybe played it on a gramophone? Then maybe you don't need any power at all. Are we done here? Are we done? I hate you.